The title of tonight's talk is a bit of a tongue twister. Let's see how good your English is. Mind your mind, find your mind. You get it? Mind your mind, find your mind. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? Do you know what it means by mind your own business? You know what it means by it's raining and it's slippery, mind your steps. Okay? So the word mind as a verb means take care, be careful. Right? And mind of course refers to our conscious awareness. However, the word mind is a bit tricky because the English usage of the mind usually refers to what's happening up in the head, the thinking process. And they may talk about emotions, they say it's from the heart. Right? But in Chinese, the word for mind covers a larger aspect. I think the word is sim, right? Sim means your heart as well as your thinking process. In fact, the word heart is found in many languages to refer to the base of our emotions, right? People say good hearted is an English expression. You're bad hearted, you're open hearted. We have a similar expression in Hokkien. Dua Leong Sim, Pai Sim, Ho Sim. I guess you have the same thing also in Malay. Right? You have Sakit Hati. <laughs> in Malay, you also have this word Dukachita and Sukachita, which is actually from Sanskrit. They use the word Chitta. Chitta is also a word that is used by the Buddha to refer to our mind. But our mind, in a more holistic sense, not just the thinking part of the mind, but mind in a sense of consciousness, of awareness, the conscious part of ourselves. As you know, we are made of mind and matter. The mental aspect, which is the intangible aspect, something that knows, that has awareness. And the physical aspect, which is a tangible aspect, Okay, that explains what I mean here by mind. When I use the word mind, I refer not only to the thinking process that's happening up in your head, which you think is happening up in your head, but also to our emotional aspects. The emotions that you feel emanating from the center of your chest. When you get angry, when you get jealous, when you get lustful thoughts, that you first detect this in your body. When you're angry, you don't get a headache yet, right? You get a heartache first, and then you get a headache because you think too much. So the emotions emanate from the heart center, the center of our chest. And then it goes up and it stimulates the nervous system, which has its CPU up in the head. And that's where all the activity is going on, and that's where you get a headache. So you get a heartache first, and the headache comes later. So that covers the first part of the title, Mind Your Mind. Mind meaning both your thinking mind as well as your feeling mind. What do you mean by find your mind? What's a mind? What's a gold mine? Gold mine is a place where they can extract gold and they can find valuable things that will benefit them. So when I talk about mind, here it means the mind of your potentials. You can find a mind of potentials within yourself if you know how to take care of your mind. That's the whole synopsis of what we're going to talk about tonight. How do we take care of the mind? And what sort of treasures can you find in your mind? In your own mind? Let me start off by quoting the first verse from the Dhammapada. Mano bubangama dhamma mano zeta mano maya So what does that mean? Mind is the forerunner of all dhammas. Mind is the chief. Mind is the leader. Everything is mind-made. What is dhamma? Dhamma means anything. The word dhamma can be translated as thing, literally. Because the word thing in English can be used for many, many meanings. Just as the word dhamma can be used for a wide range of meanings. So when the Buddha said, Mano Bhuvangama Dhamma, he means mind is the chief of all things. And what are things? Things are tangible things and intangible things. 
Intangible things are things spiritual and mental. Tangible things are things that you can see, hear, smell, taste and feel with the body. And all your verbal and physical actions stem from the mind. What you say, how you act, depends on what is your intention, what are your motivations, feelings, perceptions. I'm going to read a few more quotations from the Buddha. Just now was one from the Dhammapada, this time is from the Anguttara Nikaya, the Book of Ones. There's a whole section on the mind. So listen carefully. No other thing do I know, O monks, that is so intractable as an undeveloped mind. An undeveloped mind is truly intractable. You know what's the meaning of intractable? Difficult to control, right? If your mind is not well developed, then you will be pulled and tugged and pushed by its whims and fancies. You will be a slave of your mind rather than a master of it. No other thing do I know, O monks, that is so tractable as a developed mind. A developed mind is truly tractable. You've heard a lot of stories of people who have mastered their minds how they can perform all those psychic phenomena. They can walk on the air and disappear into the ground and they can do a lot of things. They can even disappear here and appear somewhere else or they can make multiple forms out of a single personality. No other thing do I know, O monks, that brings so much suffering as an undeveloped and uncultivated mind. An undeveloped and uncultivated mind truly brings suffering. No other thing do I know, O monks, that brings so much happiness as a developed and cultivated mind. A developed and cultivated mind truly brings happiness. No other thing do I know, O monks, that brings so much harm as a mind that is untamed, unguarded, unprotected, and uncontrolled. Such a mind truly brings much harm. No other thing do I know, O monks, that brings so much benefit as a mind that is tamed, guarded, protected, and controlled. Such a mind truly brings benefit. All these are from Angodra Nikaya, Book of Ones. I think Suttas 1 to 10, selected by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi and translated by himself. It's an edited translation. Original translation is from Jnana Ponika Thera. Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, in his new book called In the Buddha's Words, has revised this translation. But I'm taking this from this book. So you can see how important it is. I'll give you an example of how much suffering an uncontrolled or undeveloped mind can bring. Several years ago, somebody in Taiping brought up an old lady from Poko Assam, which is at the foothill, quite near to where Sasnaraka Buddhist Sanctuary is, to come to see me because the man who brought her said that this lady has some problems which she cannot solve. So I asked her, what's the problem? And she said, well, I ought to be a very happy lady. In Hokkien, they would say, Langkong wa wa tiang hum ya. Hami su le. In we. Wai kia ni. Kada tua han liao. Yang kada pig yap liao eh. How many of you cannot understand Hokkien? Hands up. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll better say it in English. <laughs> Alright. By right, I should be a happy woman. Because my children are all grown up and we have graduated. One particular son is a professional. I think he's an engineer or an architect. He's married to another professional who is an accountant. So they're living in PJ or in Subang, I forget. Nice house with everything that you can wish for. Got a car, got TV, got servants and children. So, Pusunya Mahwahiro. <laughs> okay, so after that, she says, when I'm in Fiji, 
Then when my son and my daughter-in-law go to work and the children are in school or in kindergarten or in nursery, I'm left all alone in the house. I ought to be happy, you know, nothing to do. I should watch the TV or just enjoy myself. But I sit down there and my mind just keeps on worrying for nothing. Worry about the son, worry about the daughter, worry about the grandchildren and worry about this and that. And she says that, I don't know why I cannot restrain or control my mind. And I'm caught up in that. Recently, I went to Singapore and I went to visit my sister. She's also a professional. She's a retired associate professor of English in National University of Singapore, married to a very highly qualified professional also, someone who's got a doctorate in economics and working with the Economic Planning Board. Then the father-in-law was staying with her, and the father-in-law is probably in his 80s. He was a very successful businessman before, and he had a habit of reading the newspapers and reading magazines like Business Times and Asia Week to keep track of what's happening in the world, to look at the political situation and the economic situations of the different countries because he's a businessman. He needs to know whether a place is economically stable or financially feasible for a particular project or his business. So from the past, he has been reading all these and then he keeps on thinking and projecting in the future. If this happens, what will happen? Now, this guy, taxing is down and somebody is up, and what will happen? <laughs> and how will that affect the economy and the status of a business if it is set up there? So, all these things have been habituated in him. And he is not able to stop it anymore. He's now 80, he doesn't have to do any more business. <laughs> he's retired and he's just staying at home and not doing anything. But he's reading all this and his mind keeps on working that way. And he says, I worry for nothing. And I can't stop the mind. So you see, even though you have all the material comforts and security, if you're not able to control your mind, if you're not able to mind your mind, then your mind will get you into trouble. So if you know how to mind your mind, then you can find all the hidden potentials within you. What are the hidden potentials within you? There are lots of things that we can do and we are capable of doing. But because of our upbringing, the way we were brought up by our parents, the society in which we grew up, the exposure to the mass media, to television, to video, to the billboards, to what you see around you, all these conditionings tend to stifle our potential and we don't see them. Because all these external stimuli tend to stimulate your defilements. And when the defilements arise within you, you don't see your hidden potentials. I'm going to read another quotation from the Anguttara Nikaya, which is very interesting because it gives us hope that we are essentially good and pure. Some of us might be a bit harsh on ourselves when we think about our own weaknesses and faults. We tend to be very unforgiving and very judgmental and say, I'm such a terrible person, I'm incapable, I'm inadequate, I'm inefficient compared to somebody else. There's always this sense of wanting to compare oneself with others. And that's how people suffer from inferiority complex as well as superiority complex or equality complex. (laughs) Even though you're not equal, you try to convince yourself that you're equal with another person. These are all actually forms of what we call mana in Pali. Mana means conceit. Conceit doesn't necessarily mean that you are better than another person. It could also mean that you feel you are inferior to another person or you are equal to another person. That is also a form of conceit based on the same principle of the illusion of an ego, of an image of yourself that you and society have created and then clinging to that ego. Let's go to this other quotation. It also comes from Mangodra Nikaya, Book of One, Chapter 6, 1 and 2. This mind, O monks, is luminous, but is defiled by adventitious defilements. The uninstructed worldling 
does not understand this as it really is. Therefore, for him, there is no mental development. This mind, O monks, is luminous and it is free from adventitious defilements. The instructed noble disciple or the instructed disciple of the noble one understands this as it really is. Therefore, for him, there is mental development. What does this mean? If you all are familiar with non-Theravada traditions, you would have heard of Buddha nature. Right? Have you all heard of Buddha nature? How many of you haven't heard of Buddha nature? Hands up. Wow, you all must be really staunch Theravadins or newcomers to Buddhism. (laughs) Buddha nature is a concept of non-Theravadan Buddhists particularly the Zen tradition and Tibetan tradition, which refers to this original mind. They say that everyone has the potential to become a Buddha because you are intrinsically pure. Your mind is intrinsically pure. In the Tibetan Dzogchen tradition, they talk about Rigpa, the original mind. But it's interesting that even in the Thai forest tradition, they talk about this pure mind the original pure mind. And their stance is that actually all of you are already enlightened. It's just that you don't know it. (laughs) Dogzen practice says you don't have to strive because you're already enlightened. You just have to open your eyes to see that you are enlightened and realize it. There's one simile of a poor man who did not know that someone has bequeathed him a few million in the bank. So, even though he has a few million in the bank, as long as he doesn't know that he has a few million in the bank, he will still live like a poor man, right? So, if you don't know that you are enlightened, you will still be acting like an unenlightened person. But it's actually a consolation or relief to know that you are already enlightened and you have the potential to just realize it. So it gives you hope. Because the Buddha says that the mind is luminous. It is only defiled by adventitious defilements. Adventitious means extraneous, outside. The Pali word is agantuka upakilesa. In Thai, the word agantuka has been made into a Thai word, agantuka. Agantuka means a visitor. Agantuka pra means a visiting monk. So, Agantuka Upakilesa here refers to visiting defilements. They are just visiting you, they are not yours, they are outsiders. So, this gives us a very interesting perspective because most of us tend to identify with our thoughts and our feelings. When you get angry, particularly at someone whom you are not supposed to get angry at, maybe you are taking care of your old parents. And you know that you ought to be grateful to your parents and you should not get angry. But because they are old, they are forgetful, they tend to forget to do certain things, forget to switch off the light or forget to flush the toilet when they leave. And then you get upset and you get impatient and you say, I've been telling you so many times, why don't you do it? And then you get angry and you shout at them and then suddenly you regret and have remorse because "Ah, I shouldn't be saying that to my parents. How can I be such an ungrateful son or daughter? Right? Do you have such feelings? If you're a child, because you are dependent on your parents and they're supporting you, and then sometimes when you quarrel with your parents or you are rude to them, and then you reflect on it, and then you feel bad about it. Right? Now, if you're angry, and then you identify that anger with yourself, thinking that that anger is you, or it belongs to you, then you multiply your suffering. Why not? Because you're angry. Because you're angry. Right? If you're angry and then you realize that anger has a reason and you're able to step out of it and just look at anger as an agantuka defilement, a visiting defilement. It doesn't belong to you. It's there because conditions are there for it to arise. Then, like the Buddha says in one sutta, it's like someone throwing a dart at you. If someone throws a dart at you and you're hurt, 
then you feel painful at one spot. But if somebody else throws another dart and it lands on the same spot, then you'll get double suffering. <laughs> right? So it's the same, you know, if you are angry and then you are angry because you are angry, then you are putting another dart in the same wound. But it's easier said than done. Because we tend to get so engrossed in our thoughts and emotions that we forget. And this is also supported by society, the community where you stay in. Everybody is in the same predicament. Everybody is in the same boat. And you are actually supporting one another to consolidate this illusion of self, this illusion of ego. You create an image of yourself and this image is being consolidated by people around you. And so it's a vicious cycle. It's not only an individual image of yourself, but it's also an image that is consolidated by the people around you, the people that you relate with. There's an interesting account of a contemporary spiritual teacher who was born in Germany and then was educated in Spain and in England. He was in Cambridge doing his PhD and at that time he was suffering from very deep depression, bouts of depression and he was at the verge of committing suicide. At one time the suffering was so bad that the thought arose in him, I cannot live with myself anymore. When the thought arose in him, he began to ask, hey, who is this entity that cannot live with another entity? When you say, I cannot live with myself anymore, there are two persons involved, right? (laughs) I and myself. So who are these two persons? Who is this I and who is this myself? And he investigated that sentence. And that moment, he managed to step out of association or identification with his thoughts and emotions. And he saw very clearly that these thoughts were just thoughts. So he, at that point of time, had this very sudden insight. He managed to step out and look at his thoughts and emotions and he found that this consciousness that is looking at what is happening and these thoughts are causing the suffering. But the consciousness that is watching the thoughts is not suffering at all. If you are a meditator, if you are a vipassana meditator, you will understand what I am talking about. Because when you are meditating, your teacher will tell you, whatever happens, you are supposed to note it. When anger arises, you are just supposed to note angry, angry. When you get restless, you are just supposed to note that restlessness, restless, restless. You are frustrated, you note frustrating, frustrating. And when you do that, if your meditation is good enough, you will find that the moment you note it, it disappears. It is no longer there. And then you come back to whatever object that you are watching. So for this particular person, his name is Eckhart Tolle. And he wrote a book called The Power of Now, which was a world bestseller. And now he came out with another book called New Earth, which is also another bestseller. It's interesting because he said that after he had that experience, it's not an intellectual experience. He says, immediately after he realized that thoughts and emotions do not belong to him. That is a realization of non-self. That they are just phenomena, agantuka upakulesa, guests who come in. After he realized that, then all his suffering disappeared. No more depression. Immediately, all the depression ceased and he was filled with stillness, calmness, peace and a joy that is beyond description. And after that experience, he felt very alienated from the world because he no longer fits into the world of concepts and duality anymore because he sees that there's actually no self anymore and all of us are living in this world of illusion thinking that there is a self and clinging to our concept and creation of the image of ourselves. so he could not complete his PhD and he spent the next two years maybe you could say just like the Buddha spending 49 days after his enlightenment just enjoying the fruits of liberation. He could not do any work at all. What he was doing was he would be going to the parks and sitting in the parks and just enjoying liberation. There's no self and that everything is one. He can see so perfectly that there's no division. 
between the consciousness and what's happening around. So this non-duality became so strong in him that he became very alienated from the conventional world. Could not do anything for two years. So he was just hanging around parks, enjoying the bliss of liberation. Become dysfunctional in this world, in this crazy world. So if you get enlightened and you become sane, it's like trying to live in an asylum together with all the lunatics. (laughs) But that was when he was 29. So now he's about 60. Now he's of course a very famous spiritual teacher in the West. And he talks about being in the now, staying in the present moment. And his teachings are very much in tune with the Buddha's teachings of Anicca, Dukkha and Anatta, of impermanence, suffering and not-self. Particularly not-self. Because his realization came through not-self, his stress in his teachings is not-self. How you can disidentify from all your thoughts and emotions and your body, all the forms, and be in stillness, be in the present moment, without worrying about the past or being concerned about the future. Now, I'm talking about the end result, but how do you get there? The Buddha says that originally your mind is pure. In other words, you are already enlightened. You just don't know that the defilements that defile you are actually visitors. Agantuka Upakalesas. So it just takes that moment of stepping out to see that there is no self, that all your thoughts, emotions and whatever that you can perceive through your senses are not you, do not belong to you, are not any permanent, unchanging entity called the self or ego. Let's get down to earth, be more practical in how we are going to approach this. What are the steps that we can take in order to step back and look at our thoughts and emotions and our body. Or as Eckhart Tolle says, all forms. Because there's physical form and there's thought forms. How can we step out of form and be formless? And this definition of formless means not identifying with your thought forms, nor with your physical form. Looking at them as not self, as conditioned phenomena. How things, thoughts, emotions, even your body, how they change and occur or happen because of causes and conditions. If you are a bit knowledgeable or you have studied some biology or physics or if you read newspapers or magazines like Time and Newsweek, you will be aware that your body does not belong to you. It doesn't belong to you because all the cells in your body are actually arising and passing away. There are millions of cells in your body that are dying every moment and new ones are being formed. Did you give them any order to do that? No. When you are sick, your body, your immune system knows what antibodies to deploy at which particular areas of the body. Do you have any say in that? No. Right? So you know intellectually that the body doesn't belong to you. Right? But still you go to the mirror and then you put on your (laughs) cosmetics, you comb your hair, and then when you get old and wrinkles, and then you start to worry and say, oh, I'm getting old already. (laughs) So there is this gap between intellectual understanding and an actual intuitive knowledge or insight into non-self. You already know that your thoughts and emotions are not going to be there forever. You're not going to be happy forever. You're not going to be sad forever. If you're going to be depressed, you're not going to be depressed forever. But, how can you stop being depressed when you are? Being angry when you are? How can you stop all these things? What is the practical way of doing it? You must understand, as you say, that this concept of non-self, or this idea of non-self, is based on Anicca. Anicca means impermanence. Things are arising and passing away. We all know that everything is impermanent. You know that after you're born, you're going to die one day. Right? You know that your car is not going to last forever. The clothing are not going to last forever. Everybody knows that. 
But yet, we keep on chasing after things that are impermanent. Things are impermanent not because they just arise and pass away for no reason. There are causes and conditions. Things arise because of causes and conditions and things cease because of causes and conditions. In order to understand non-self, we must be able to see this arising and passing away. See it with your mind's eye, not just thinking about it intellectually. And you must also be able to perceive or understand the causes and conditions that give rise to this impermanent phenomena. So that is the theory behind it. The very, very simple technique of overcoming all these mental negativity is a very simple three steps. One is to disidentify yourself with all these thoughts and emotions. They are not you. They don't belong to you. They are not your ego. They are not yourself. Number one. Secondly, accept what has happened. If you are angry, anger has already arisen. You cannot undo it. You cannot undo the anger that has arisen, but what you can do is to stop it from continuing. You also accept the fact that because anger has arisen in you, it has triggered off a lot of physical reactions in your body. When you get angry, it's not only the mind that gets angry, your body also feels very uncomfortable. You get congestion in the center of your chest, in your solar plexus area, you could also feel heat emanating from that center of your chest to various parts of the body, perhaps up to your head as well, your face becomes flushed or your body becomes very heated up and you might even feel a very soury feeling in your gut. So these are the physical reactions of the mental negativity that has occurred. So you have to accept that because it has really occurred, you cannot push it away. One of the mistakes that most people fall into is that after they get angry and they feel all this uncomfortable emotions in your body, they want to push it away. They don't want that. They don't want that uncomfortable feeling. And not wanting that uncomfortable feeling creates also another negative mental attitude, which also will produce some more of these so-called neuropeptides, amino acids that are produced by the mind. These will be injected into the other healthy cells and they will create more of this uncomfortable feeling. Everybody knows that being angry or being depressed is not good. And yet the mind keeps on hopping at the same object. So if you know that, perhaps you can understand why the Buddha says, Vedana Pachayatana. Feelings, condition, craving. So you can understand that if it's good feelings, it conditions craving, right? If something feels good, you want more of it. But if something bad, why do you want more of it? You don't want more of it, right? But unconsciously or uncontrollably, the mind wants more of it. Okay, so the simple technique is if you want to stop thinking, all your depression, all your anger, all your worries, all your concerns are about things of the past or the future. Right? Not something that happened in the past you didn't like. Something that's going to happen in the future and you fear. Oh, what's going to happen? What if I don't get this done? What if this doesn't happen? All these things causing all these thoughts to occur within you. All based on the past and the future. So what's the trick? If you don't want to think of the past and the future, stay in the present moment. Very simple. Come back to your five senses. But that's easier said than done. If you open your eyes and look at something, and then that something will remind you again of what was <laughs> making you angry. <laughs> Let's get down to practice. Let's talk about the five senses. What you can see, hear, smell, taste and feel with your body. All these objects can only be perceived in the present moment, right? You can only see something with your eyes that is right in front of you. What you saw yesterday, you cannot see with your eyes right now, can you? Can you see something that you haven't seen before with your eyes right now? You can't. Neither can you hear, smell, taste 
or filled with the body what is not in the present moment. But when you're fast asleep at night and all your senses are shut down, you don't see, smell, taste or feel with the body. You don't even feel your bed. And you are in a nice dream. In your dream, you might be in a party having a nice time. And there you can hear music and you might be singing karaoke and then you're having a fun time talking and chatting and dancing. Right? Can you feel that in your dream? Or you might be having a nasty dream, quarreling with your husband or quarreling with your parents or fighting with somebody or running away as robbers are chasing you. All these things are happening where? In your mind. So, the principle is very simple. If you want to stay in the present moment, stay with your five senses. It is the mind that can take objects of the past, present, future, fantasies and anything else. The mind can also take Nibbana, of course, as object. When people are worried, are depressed, it is not the five senses that are making them depressed, right? It is the mind. When people suffer from insomnia, it's because they think too much and they cannot stop their thinking. Then they take these tranquilizers and try to sleep. Tranquilizer has a way of doing something to your body probably stimulating some glands to produce some enzymes or hormones that will tranquilize your brain. It becomes numb and you cannot think. Or it will suppress the secretion of certain enzymes that activate your brain and your nerves. Of course, there are always side effects involved. There was one devotee recently. He had an affair with another woman. They had a very good relationship for several years. And then something happened and they broke up. And then after that, he regretted and kept on thinking about her. He came to see me and he said, No, my life is like he's going to end. There's nothing worth living for. Typical thing, you know. You go and see any songs, poetry, you'll see that they're all talking about all these heartbreaks. <laughs> it's a typical human condition. And to that particular person, it looks like it's the end of the world. <laughs> and he said, Oh, all you need to do is to stay with the present moment. He said, How can I? Whatever I see, hear, smell, taste. Everything reminds me of her. (laughs) How to forget her? (laughs) So, it's not so easy to stay with the eye sense or the ear sense because we are so conditioned into interpreting what we see immediately. Actually, what we perceive through the five senses are just bare data. It's just like you inputting data into your computer. These are all just bare data. What you see are just colors. What you hear are just vibrations. What you smell are just smells. There's no label attached to it. What you taste is just taste, not a label attached to whether it's sour or bitter or spicy or stringent or whatever. It's just taste. Give you a very... Practical demonstration now. Kuru Zen, Pamazuka Bion, Ele. Tegata Goma Mia, Pa, Nale Jadane. It's just vibrations, right? Can you understand anything? <laughs> it's just vibrations. Actually, all these five senses only take in bare data. And your CPU is your mind. Your mind is the one that processes all this data. If you know, the language that I'm speaking in, then you would be able to decipher what those sounds, what those vibrations stood for. But if you didn't, it's just vibrations. <laughs> Another interesting thing is the thing that we used to play when we have these camps and games for children and teenagers and youth camps. Like we blow up a particular picture. We zoom into a particular picture and then we distribute that picture all around and ask people to try to identify what that is. Imagine if you take a picture of your skin and magnify it 500 times and you see, you wouldn't know what it is. You would think it's craters on the moon. <laughs> right? Then you would not be able to decipher what it is and then later you will see that it's part of a big picture. Then only you will know what it is. So what you perceive through your five senses are just bad data. But because we have been conditioned to immediately process this data, it's not so easy to keep in the present moment. 
Right? When you see something immediately, you think you already know what it is, and that concept will trigger off memories or perceptions about the thing that you are looking at. So it's the same with sounds. Unless, of course, you are staying in a place like Sasanaraka Buddhist Sanctuary, near the jungle, at the edge of the forest or in the forest. Then you don't hear the sound of traffic, you don't hear horns, people horning, you don't hear people talking, you don't hear music. You are in the forest, what do you hear? Birds, you hear the insects, maybe you hear the sound of the waterfall or stream. And these are all very soothing. Many people, when they come to meditate in SBS, when they cannot find, for example, the breathing process, they cannot follow the breathing in and breathing out, they cannot follow the rising and falling, they find it not so suitable to do sitting and touching. And they find that they can get very concentrated by just listening to sounds. Just keeping your attention on sounds and they can get focused. And after that, when they are focused, then all these things become obvious to them, the breath and other parts of the body. But I discourage them from taking that as their basic object because I said that when you go back to the world, you're not going to get the same conditions. So you better don't practice on using sound as your primary object. And then smells and tastes are not always there. They are there only at certain times when you eat and when there's some fragrance or some bad smell around. So they are not readily available. All of these five senses, the one that is consistently there all the time is your body. Your body is there all the time. Your breath is there all the time. All the sensations that you can feel in your body is there all the time unless you are fast asleep or you are unconscious. For example, right now, while you are listening to me, because you are listening to me, perhaps you are not paying attention to your body, but if you now direct your attention to your buttocks, you will be able to feel certain sensations there, right? Your buttocks are touching the floor, you can feel hardness, pressure, maybe some heat, some tingling sensations, whatever. You can also feel other things like the muscles in various parts of the body, your back trying to keep you erect, you can feel a strain if you are not used to sitting down cross-legged in certain parts of the body. You can also feel certain neutral feelings like the contact of your skin with the aircon, the contact of the skin with your clothes, particularly your waist with your waistband, tight parts of your clothes. You can feel all these things. It's always there. So, for a person who is suffering from insomnia because of depression or because of whatever, it's very simple. You cannot sleep. You just lie down on your bed and then relax the whole body. Keep your attention on the body. Be aware of all the various physical sensations in the body. Your head touching your pillow, your shoulders touching your bed, the various limbs touching the bed, and then your skin touching your clothing. And as you do that, because you're actually tired, you've been thinking so much, you're really tired, you want to sleep, but you don't know how to stop thinking. So if you're able to change the subject of your thoughts from what's making you depressed or what's making you angry or worried to just watching your body sensations, it's so boring that you'll fall asleep in no time. (laughs) Right, so next time you're having problems with insomnia, don't go and buy tranquilizers. Just try what I tell you. So this is a very simple technique. So simple and yet very profound. Now, we can make use of this technique not only when you are suffering from insomnia or from depression or from chronic thoughts, but we can actually make use of this principle throughout our daily lives. Who says that the practice of meditation or the practice of mindfulness can only be practiced, can only be done with your eyes closed and your legs crossed. Not necessarily. Although I always like to say it's like charging your battery, your handphone battery. If you want to use the handphone throughout the day, you've got to charge the battery first. After you've charged it, then you put it in your handphone and you can use it wherever you go. So formal sitting meditation is like charging your battery. You take time off every morning maybe. If you can spare the time, maybe half an hour, if not, 15 minutes also is good. Settle down, sit down with your eyes closed, relax your whole body and just be with the body. Follow your breath if you can, follow your rising and falling, 
Or if you can't, then be aware of your body sensations. And if your mind runs off to the past or the future, just be aware that the mind has run off and come back to the body. It's a very simple exercise, but it's actually very rejuvenating and recharging. Do you know that more than 80% of our energy is used in thinking? At one time we had a camp for USM students in SPS and we invited an ex-biology professor from MU to share and he was talking about how much energy that we humans use. And he says that more than 80% of the energy we use goes up to the thinking process. So it's no wonder that if you're a white-collared worker sitting in an aircon room from 8 to 5 and then you come back in the evening after driving through a traffic jam and then you are just flattened out, can't do anything, can't even watch TV, just go to bed and then next day you repeat the whole routine. Right? But if you're a construction worker, you can work from 8 until 5, come back, take a bath and go to the pub and drink until 12 midnight and go back and sleep next day, come back to work fresh. Why? Because you don't think. <laughs> they just do. Okay? Because they just do. The energy expended in doing is less than in thinking. Right? So if you're able to just spare a few minutes, 15 minutes break, to just stop thinking, all your compulsive thinking, leave them aside, and just be with the present moment, be with your body, that itself is very rejuvenating. Some years ago, I read somewhere that there was this American executive. He must have done some meditation before and he found that it was very beneficial for him. So, he decided to give a tryout in his office. So, one day he told his staff, Okay, you guys can come to the office and don't have to start work until 15 minutes later. Just take a break. Just sit down, close your eyes and just be aware of the breath. After trying that out, he found that the efficiency of his staff increased many fold. There's also another interesting story of a school teacher in America. She must also be a meditator. She went to class one day and the children were all very naughty, talking and making an uproar. And she came in and said, Okay, quiet children, quiet, quiet. Now just sit down at your desk and just be quiet for one minute. Don't do anything, just... Sit down, relax, and just watch your breath. Now, these American kids, they've never been exposed to meditation before. They don't know what is introspection. For them, the whole culture is all about getting things. Getting things, getting more. And it's always external and nothing internal. So, this is the first time that these kids were exposed to introspection or watching their own bodies. So, after one minute is over, everybody was quiet and settled. Then the teacher continued her lesson. The next day, she came back to class. And all the children were very enthusiastic and said, Teacher, teacher, let's play the one-minute game again. <laughs> they love the one-minute game, you know, because stillness is so pacifying and so rejuvenating. So, even though the practice of mindfulness or the practice of awareness of what's happening to you can be done any time throughout the day, it is also a good practice to do formal meditation. However much time you can spare. If you can't spare 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes. If not 10 minutes, 5 minutes. If not 5 minutes, maybe 1 minute. <laughs> There's also another interesting story of a Burmese guy. He set his wristwatch alarm to beep every hour and he decided that he just wanted to take 1 minute off every hour. Can you spare 1 minute an hour? Just a minute off every hour, just stop whatever he's doing and watch his breath. A minute a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> keeps the psychotherapist away. So after that, he just did one minute per hour per day. And imagine, if you are awake for how many hours? How many minutes do you get? If you can't spend 15 minutes in a row, at least you can do that in the toilet. <laughs> so, it is still good to take a break and be with your present moment whenever you can. Now, besides formal meditation, sitting quietly and 
trying to be with your body. You can also practice watching your mind, minding your mind throughout the day. Every time, if you can create the habit to remind yourself, ask yourself, what's the mind doing? What's the mind doing? And the moment you ask yourself what's the mind doing, you'll be able to see what the mind is doing. Is it thinking? Is it imagining? Is it fantasizing? Is it worrying of the past or the future? The moment you see that it is caught up in all this compulsive thinking, then stop it and be with the present moment, whatever you are doing. Whether you are walking to the car park, walking to the toilet, sitting in front of a computer, stop and be aware of physical sensation, your fingers at the keyboard your buttocks touching the seat. If you're walking in the toilet, your leg movements, what you see in front of you. You could also actually open up your awareness to all the five senses and look at how the mind is reacting or responding to the five senses. No thinking, and yet, what is the mind doing? The mind has got a very special characteristic, and that is knowing something. The mind must always have an object. It's always thinking or aware of something. It cannot do without an object. If there's no object, there's no mind. So, if you want to stop it from thinking, you must give it another option, something else to do. Or you'll get back to the thinking again. So, what do you do? If you don't want to get caught up in your compulsive thinking or compulsive emotions and feelings, bring it to the present moment. Bring it to your body. You can always be aware of your body whatever you're doing. Bringing it back to the present moment keeps you sane and centered. That's how when you mind your mind, then you will see that all your thoughts and emotions arise because of causes and conditions. And you begin to understand what non-self is. You begin to let go of your grip on the ego. It is the ego, illusion of the ego, the self created image of yourself that is the cause of many a problem. Right? It is because this ego expects certain things. How you behave, how you react, how people should behave and how things should happen. And when these expectations are not met, then you will meet with frustration, with disappointment, anger and so forth. But if you are able to see all these things and understand that expectations are just expectations, assumptions are just assumptions, you understand things for what they are, then you can still function in the world. Not blindly clinging to your perceptions of what things are. You understand that whatever you're doing, whatever decisions that you make, come from conditioning, causes and conditions, conditioning, sometimes beyond your control. In fact, most of the times beyond your control. There's one article that's been circulating around the internet about this guy who talks about 90 10. Have you heard of this 90-10 formula? He says that 90% of what happens to you is beyond your control and only 10% is under your control. Arjun Brahm in one of his talks says that there's no such thing as free will. In the West, people like to talk about free will. He says that you're here tonight not because you choose to come but you've got no choice. <laughs> Why do you have no choice? Uh, because all the causes and conditions are there that made you come here. Did you have any choice to be born in this world? No choice. Did you have any choice to be born beautiful or ugly, fat or thin, slim or overweight? you got no choice. Do you have any choice to be uh, born intelligent or stupid, talented or not? You have no choice. And the choice is only very apparent. You think that you are making a choice, but all your decisions are conditioned by many, many things. How you were brought up when you were a kid, how your teachers taught you when you were in school, what you were exposed to in the mass media, what you see every day happening around you, and the people that you mix around with. All these influence you. So, you can keep on reminding yourself, what's the mind doing? What's the mind doing? Then you will be able to see how your thoughts arise. Because every time you ask that question, you're actually stepping back to look at what's happening. And then immediately after that, once you know what the mind is doing, then you must give it another optional object, which is your body, the five senses, anything in the present moment. 
Of course, even if you bring it to the present moment like what you see, then that will also trigger off some more thoughts. And then you can see how the thoughts arise. Because you see something, certain thoughts arise. Because you hear something, certain thoughts arise. And because of those thoughts, it will trigger off other thoughts. So you can see all this whole chain of conditionality and that will deepen and internalize your understanding of not-self. The more you understand not-self, the more selfless you become, the more unselfish you become, and the more you are able to loosen the grip of your illusory ego on yourself. And then you'll be able to find your own mind of potentials. That within you, actually, the mind is luminous, it is clear, and it is full of positive emotions like loving-kindness, compassion, generosity, and considerateness. And you can see and understand the oneness of all beings. Everything actually is one, you don't know. Like this guy I was telling you about, Eckhart Tolle, after he got his insight or enlightenment, he felt so much connected with everything that he couldn't work temporarily. But now, after that two years, he managed to get back to the world of form and he's a very successful and influential spiritual teacher in the West. Now, all of us are actually made up differently. Just last week, we had a workshop called Discover Your Own Personality. The Greek philosophers, many thousands of years ago, have categorized human beings into four main types of personalities, four main types of characters. One is the fun-loving sort of person. They call it the sanguine. The second type of person is one who is a choleric, a dominant person, a very dominating person, a bossy sort of person, wants things to be done his own way. The third sort of person is an idealist. And the fourth type of person is a pragmatic person, very easygoing, a very chin chai sort of person. Now, to illustrate how these four people get things done, the first type wants things done in a fun way. The second type wants things done his way. <laughs> the third type wants things done the ideal way. And the fourth type wants things done the easy way. <laughs> All of us are made up of these four types of character. It may be a mixture, but one of these predominates. Look at yourself. What sort of person are you? Are you the person who wants to do things in an easy way, or in the ideal way, in the best possible way, or is it my way? Or you want to do it the fun way, that everybody has fun. Of course, in a society, we need all sorts of characters to make it work. If you only have the first type, everybody will have fun and nothing will be done. <laughs> if you have the second type only, then everybody will be quarreling with one another because they want to do it my way. <laughs> and then you will have the third type, an idealist, he's a thinker. He's always thinking and thinking and thinking of doing things the best way and he'll never get anything done. <laughs> one of my students is like that. He belongs to this third type. I mean, he wants to get things done. He will try to think of the easiest and the best possible way of doing it, the quickest way of doing it. And he may spend about five months trying to think out the easiest way to do it when he could do it the difficult way in one week. <laughs> but the mindset is like that. You cannot tell him to do it in one week because he says, I'm trying to find the easiest way, the best possible way to do it. <laughs> the last time is the easy type. He wants to do things the easy way. But the easy way is not always the correct way. Right? <laughs> if you do things easy, sometimes you cannot attain your goal. So, all of us are made up of a combination of these four types of characters. In some people, one character is more predominant than the other. Usually it is more predominant. And so that's how we discover our own personality. If we are able to watch ourselves. Watch your mind. Take care of your mind. See what are your mental tendencies. What sort of person are you? 
If you are made up that way, not because you want to, you have no choice, because you were born that way. There's no free will with regard to what sort of character you want to be. Now, each type of these characters have their own strengths and weaknesses. So, if you realize your own strength, then you try to develop your strengths. And if you know your own weaknesses, and if you're mindful, you're watching your mind all the time, when your weaknesses arise, then you can know how to minimize them. So, I hope that you will be able to try to put this into practice. It's actually a very simple practice of just watching your mind all the time, whatever you're doing, and then coming back to the present moment. The present moment means whatever you're doing. You're driving a car, you're walking to the car park, you're going to the toilet, you are watching on the computer, your fingers are on the keyboard, you're bringing your attention back. You get caught up in thoughts and ideas. Because thoughts and ideas, although they have their advantages, they also have their disadvantages. If you get caught up in too much thinking, then try to watch your mind, come back to the present moment, whatever you are doing. Cloud your mind, do not belong to you. Come back to the present moment. So if you want to really find out your hidden potentials, you should try your mind of potentials. Okay? To free to ask. And the question is, just now I talked about not having a choice of the quality of your birth. But how does that relate to the law of karma? Well, the law of karma works even though you don't know it. It's just like the law of gravity. Isaac Newton doesn't have to discover the law of gravity. It's there all the time. The law of karma is operating all the time, but you don't know all the intricate mechanics of how the law of karma works. Whatever action that you do, creates a karmic potential and when the conditions are right, the karma will give results and you don't know when the results are going to be given. All of us have done so much karma before. For example, when I was a young kid, one of the things I used to do is to catch cockroaches and then put them into the taco fire <laughs> and then enjoy the smell of the poor cockroach being burnt. Another one of the things that I like to do is because I lived in Claudic Bus in Penang, so we were still using firewood at that time, no gas. So when I was in primary school, I would get up early in the morning to boil water, boil my own hard boiled eggs to eat. The place is infested with rats. When you switch on the light, the rats are temporarily blinded, so they are quite slow. So what I would do is I would take a Kuali cover, put it there. Then catch the rat and then I will just go around and woo until the poor fellow is busy and then when I open the lid I will just kill it. <laughs> Although I'm a virtuous monk now. <laughs> I don't know when I have to repay all this karma. <laughs> I cannot tell you that. So karma is karma, it's been created. When the time is right, you will give its result. You cannot run away from it. But you have no choice. <laughs> When I talk about choice, she is referring to Chetana or volition. Your volition also comes about because of causes and conditions. Why you want to do wholesome deeds is because of the Dhamma talk that you heard. But if you go back now and you try to ask yourself, where is my mind and what is my mind doing? And that's because I told you. Right? That is the cause and that is the condition for the rising of Chetana. So that's why the Buddha says one of the very important prerequisites for attaining Sotapanna, becoming a stream enterer, to attain the first stage of enlightenment, is associating with wise people, listening to the Dhamma talk. Second. Number three, putting the Dhamma into practice. So these are all conditions. You cannot get enlightened if you do not listen to a Dhamma talk. Yeah? You cannot get enlightened if you don't associate with the right people. It's your choice, but somebody influenced you to come. 
what I'm saying when you say there's no free choice is that the choice is not free. The choice is conditioned. You don't make a choice freely out of your own will. There's no such thing as free choice. All choices are conditioned phenomena. When I was small, I watched TV and there you were always advertising this watch. I forget what's the name. Is it Timex? Every time you see TV and then you will see this advert, Timex, Timex. So when I came of age to be able to possess a watch, the first thing I said to my father was, I want a Timex. <laughs> my father said, no, no, Timex is not a good watch. I should get a citizen. But I said, no, I want a Timex. <laughs> Why do I want a Timex for? Because it has been conditioned. And that's why people spend millions in advertisements and billboards. You know, what are the returns? It's very unconscious. You don't know these things are just embedded into your subconscious. And that's how your free choice comes about. <laughs> it's not free. You've got to pay for it. <laughs> okay, somebody wanted to ask something. What happens when you discover that 90% not in control? Sometimes you feel very sad because there's no choice. <laughs> Okay, just now I told you about the three principles. First thing is that to disidentify that mean these thoughts and emotions are not you, not yourself. Secondly, you have to accept the fact that these things have happened due to causes and conditions. Thirdly, in order for you not to get caught up in compulsive thinking, you come back to the present moment. Okay, that will calm your mind. And when your mind is calm, then wiser decisions will arise give you a particular example in this article that was circulated in the internet. Okay, supposing early in the morning before you go to the office, you're having breakfast and your little daughter spilled coffee over the table. And then you got angry and you scolded her and then your wife would argue with you and say, well, it's not her fault, why should you scold her? You know, and then you could quarrel with your wife and then next evening when you come back, the wife has a sour face. The relationship is already strained because of that incident in the morning. Now, look at it this way. 90% is beyond our control. What does that mean? It means that you've got no control over what your little daughter did. She slipped and accidents do happen. She slipped and spilled the coffee over the table. Okay? But because you got into an argument with your wife and then you were late, you had to rush to get to the office. As you rush to get into the office, you might even get into an accident. Right? <laughs> okay. So he said, what you could have done is if you could have just accepted what has happened. Accidents do happen. It has happened, so what can you do? Just say, oh, it's alright dear. I'll be careful next time. And then clean it up. If you can keep your cool, that would have happened. That is the 10%. That is the 10% that you can do. The 90% is gone already. There's nothing you can do about it. And a lot of things happen to us that way. It is because of ignorance. We don't understand the conditionality of phenomena. That we always have this expectations of how things should be. It's not to say that you shouldn't make expectations. If you don't make expectations, plans, you don't make projections for the future, you're not going to get anything done. Right? You can make all these things but without attachment. With the full understanding that things may turn out otherwise. That's why people always have alternative options. Option A, option B, option C. If this doesn't work, that will work. That's how you strategize your planning. So, there's nothing wrong with planning, there's nothing wrong with expectations. What is wrong is attachment. What is wrong is not understanding that all these are caused by causes and conditions. Any more questions? Yes. The statement says that it's mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Can you talk on it? Mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Maybe that can be the subject of my next talk. <laughs> now, mind over matter works when your mind is very powerful. Many years ago, I compiled and translated a book called Dharma Therapy. It's out of print now. It's cases of how people recovered miraculously through the practice of Satipatthana meditation. People who were diagnosed with terminal cancer, with certain diseases that 
uh, no longer curable, they are declared one case by the doctors. And then when they do Satipatthana meditation, they get into certain levels of insight and concentration which enable them to break through, which means that all the symptoms of their disease reach a climax. Climax means there's excruciating pain and they are able to persist and watch through that pain and then suddenly the pain disappears, sometimes very dramatically like an explosion. And then everything becomes calm and clear and after they find that their ailment has disappeared and they are fully recovered. You must have heard of Singapore's former Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew's son. He's presently the Prime Minister, right? At one time he was suffering from cancer and then his father persuaded him to take off for a couple of months and he was on intensive retreat. After that, he fully recovered from his cancer. So if your mind is powerful, it can overcome matter. But if your mind is not powerful enough, you have to mind your body in order to mind your mind. <laughs> Take care of your body, make sure that it's in good health, keep away from junk food and eat only things that are suitable for you. Don't follow your taste or your likes and dislikes, but follow what is suitable. Have regular exercise, keep away from cigarettes and alcohol and so forth. Have a good lifestyle and also practice Qigong or yoga or whatever that will help to attune your mind for better progress. Although this is not stressed in Theravada Buddhism, in other spiritual systems, like in Hindu practice for example, there is quite an important stress on preparing your body first before you start to meditate. Like doing Hatha Yoga, opening your chakras and so forth. Another thing is, if you don't mind, it doesn't matter. That's true. Like what I was telling you about, if you are able to this identify from the thoughts and emotions, then it doesn't matter what these thoughts and emotions are because they don't belong to you in the first place. They are there because of causes and conditions. You look at them, let them go. Don't pursue them. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. It can also apply to the example I gave just now of the couple whose daughter spilled coffee over breakfast. Right? You don't mind. It has happened, so what? You don't try to resist what has happened in the present moment. You accept whatever has happened but you can make plans for the future. In the future, be more careful so that it won't happen again. Hope that answers the question. <laughs>